Yo, what's up all you beautiful people? I have been asked to make this video several times in the last couple of days. Um, so, if you guys haven't heard already, I am making a comic book called The Last Day. And it's based on an audio drama that I wrote in 2014. It is a science fiction thriller adventure about a boy who gets superpowers from a computer. Um, I have struggled to talk about the comic and, and where I want to go with it because I don't want to give away stuff that's going to ruin the story or ruin the pacing of the story. It's a, I want it to be a, uh, something of a, a perpetual crescendo and a slow burn all at the same time, meaning I'm not doing what other comics are doing in the literary sense. Um, in the literary sense, they tell you start in the middle of a really exciting situation and really hook your audience and they will and then they'll want to know how and so I've been getting I've been in the middle of this like thing where I'm, I'm going over old books that I like and I just want to just tell a story the way I want to tell it so yes it's good to know the literary rules but I'm breaking a lot of the rules because I've, I've already planned out what the story is going to be and so it's it's hard for me to tell you guys to talk, you know, to talk about it. So I'm I'm going to attempt to do this because I've been asked to do it several times, okay? So Silas Midori is a superhero name that I came up with many 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 years ago and I decided to put him in an audio drama. Now he's the main character of the comic book. So here's what goes on. In the city of Rivers, you have a bunch of people living and working together in this small but divided town. Uh, there's a river that goes through the city, and on one side of the river, you have the well-to-do upper-class elites. And then on the outskirts of the cities and on the other side of the river, you have the favelas, the works, the, the workers, the warehouses, bad part of town, that sort of thing. The, the river isn't very prominent anymore. That was how the city started. Right now, it's just kind of a bunch of stuff surrounding one giant tower in the middle of the city. And that's where uh, the power structures kind of kind of go. Like, that's how I see power structures in my mind, is you have a bunch of people in, in an area, and they start to push in together. And, and, and the more that society starts to push in together, the, uh, the upper class starts to rise higher and everybody keeps pushing in to try to climb that ladder. So it's a visual representation of how I see power structures in my mind. Yeah, we're going there. Uh, <laughs> you guys kept asking me, so I got to do it. I need to light my face just a little bit. Can I? There we go. Just a little bit. A little bit better. So, <sighs> wow, that's, that's not a little bit. That's a lot. There we go. So in the city of Rivers, you have the this this power divide, you know, and it, it works and lends itself to sci-fi fairly well, in my opinion. Sci-fi is all about like like the cyberpunk future, the dystopian cyberpunk future, what a lot of us envision. Uh, it's like the world of Robocop, it's the world of aliens, it's the world of um, Terminator, it's uh a lot of what I did was drawn from the original Total Recall, including some of the design of the VR chair that they use. It was either going to be Total Recall or Neuromancer. I mean, we don't have a whole lot of options to pull from, you know. <laughs> we have Neuromancer, we have Total Recall, and we have The Matrix. Now, in Neuromancer, you get the, the goggles that go over your face, your eyes or whatever. They're really cool looking. Um, in Total Recall, you have the things that kind of hover on the side of your heads or your temples, and that was the design we went with. And then the Matrix, you're like literally jacked in with wires. I like to play with all of those things throughout the book, but um, it, the whole plot is centered around, there's Kasonic Enterprises, it's, it's the entertainment company, it's the entertainment company, and they prize themselves on VR, full-dive VR, so you can 
basically project your mind into a computer and live out certain scenarios. It's not a new concept. A lot of isekai, I think like most isekai anime is based on this concept. Um, a lot of sci-fi movies have been written about it. Like I said, The Matrix, stuff like that. Um, but what I wanted to do is focus... I want to introduce the idea, but then I want to focus on what happens to the people who are jacked in so much that it's a part of their life. What happens to them in real life? And so there's two kinds of stories that I wanted to tell, and I didn't have the ability to do that in the audio drama. I kind of had to keep the story moving. I had to keep the pace going along. But what I wanted to do was... In the same way you have people who are like on TikTok and social media way too much, I wanted to show the effects of over overstimulating your brain with VR and how it kind of like drains people of their life force, so to speak. It kind of sucks the soul out of them because it's just overstimulation of entertainment. And so the society is built with people that just they spend all their time and their money and their pursuing these hopes and dreams that they'll never obtain because it's not real it, it gives you something right away and then you want to get back in there you just want to get back in there and do it again and, and relive that and it's like that's time that could be spent working on things in your real life but the the way the society is set up is kind of sucked all the uh, all the air out of the room and taken a lot of the advantages away from people so <clears throat> i would say that this is something more of a post-capitalistic society so I wouldn't blame it on um, uh, capitalism. I would I would say it's something that's post-capitalist and that is blended into something else. I don't want to go socialism, communism. That I think that's been done before. I'd like to try to create a world that is very very laissez-faire capitalist, um, very corrupt, but only like a, a thin veneer of capitalism is involved. So people will still go to work, people still have wages to spend, but it's kind of predetermined what their wages are going to be spent on, even though they're working, you know? So it's it's not so much that you can just open a business because the opportunities aren't there. The... Um, the industries are kind of overregulated. People, there's no entry point for people that don't come from money or don't have a lot, um, and you're not. And and it's it's to the point that you're kind of in a caste society at that point, where you're you're born as a nobody. You're going to be a worker. You're the worker class. That's all you're ever going to be. And there's just not a lot of prospects for people. But they try to live and try to do the best they can, and their lives are so hopeless and so drab that they spend their money on these VR adventures so that they could have some sort of endorphin rush. And the, and the arcade is much ha much very happy to, to sell them that. And so that's the world, that's the setting that I'm putting it in. Also, it's, it's a world that's post-war. And so I want to... Later in the series, play on the types of divides that caused America to split and to break up into different factions. And so in Rivers, it's a it's a city that is surrounded by three large cities that are very much like them, like it, but different. They have their own different cultures. And um, so you're going to have Rivers, you're going to have Harbor Town, and you're going to have Cathedral. Harbor Town is sailor. It's like a port. It's sea life, it's bars, it's uh, debauchery. Um, people are there for a short while and then they're gone. And, you know, if you need to ship things, that's that's kind of the main port of entry or whatever. But then Cathedral is where the, the culture and the art and uh, the, the scholarly people live, the more upper class. And so I don't know if we're going to poke around too much in the city of Cathedral, but I, I do want to point out that those cities are there and they're and they're surrounded. Rivers is the worker class. And so that's that's where our story takes place. And for the, much of the first f couple of series. Um, and that's the other thing is I, I plan on creating different chapters that, that kind of expand outward. So we start at Rivers and we just kind of expand out to other places. But... 
<clears throat> right now, as far as the audio drama, it's five episodes, and these episode the these episodes are like three to four issues each, you know, depending on if I just stick to the story. Now, with this first one, I ended up adding things, and I expect to be adding things more that will give you more context of the world. Like I said, there's a lot that I couldn't do in the audio medium that I want to do visually, and I want to show the lives of the people. And so we're going to kind of deviate for, from some areas and show things about the world that they live in that aren't necessarily uh, explored in the audio drama. Now, Silas... He has a friend named Steve. Steve is very um, technologically advanced in, 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 in intellect. So he knows how to work with computers and machines. He knows how to work with systems. I designed Steve to be an everyday man um, in appearance. So he, he looks friendly and reliable to the degree that you don't notice him. And I wanted him to be like, like one of the descriptions I, I have in his design was if you just, if, if you went to the gas station, you would see two or three other people just like him. Like, like he just, he blends in so well, but at, at the same time, when you meet him, he's friendly. You just, you automatically like him. You want to trust him because of his personality and he seems reliable. So he seems like he could be the manager. You, you wouldn't question it. It, he could be the janitor, and you wouldn't question it. He could be the guy behind the counter, and you wouldn't question it. He could be the guy fixing the air conditioner, and you just wouldn't think about it. Like, that's, the, that's what Steve is, and that's part of the strength that he has is his ability to just blend into anything and anywhere because I need a character like that to be able to get in, get out, do things that need to be done, and not really be caught. And if you have someone who looks like a spy, he's probably a spy, you know? So that's the kind of uh, character that I wanted Steve to be. He's also, but because he's so intellectual, he's he's like a scientist and a mechanic all in the same person. And um, I don't know if I want to say that this serves as a foil for Silas because Silas is the opposite. Silas stands out. Silas is loud and impulsive and brash and comedic, you know, and uh, sometimes silly and immature. But he, he has a good heart he wants to do good but nobody has really taken the time to show him how to do good and so now we have a character like steve that serves as more balanced figure he's he's a mentor uh he can be fun and silly at the same time because this is his friend you wouldn't hang out with silas if he didn't have that part of, of, of his personality and so when you hear them bantering back and forth it's like they they understand each other's silliness they understand how each other think and they don't assume that um, the other doesn't understand. Like there's sometimes there's this like thin wall between friends where you just assume they don't know what you're saying. And when you really are friends, that 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 wall kind of disappears. So I want to have all of these modern aspects of relationships within the book, but within this very dark, oppressive, um, and depressed world you know i want to have optimistic characters in a dark world i don't i'm not trying to go grim dark where everybody is stoic and and gritty and dark and mean and violent like yes obviously there will be people like that in the world but i don't want to tell that story i want to tell people a story of people of human optimism because no matter how dark it gets and no matter how dreary it gets like people adapt and we always adapt to the situations around us. And so once once these characters, they've, they've learned to live in this world. There's a lot of advanced technology. There's a lot of cultural things that I want to try to write into the story. But I want to do it in a way where we as the reader might be amazed by some of it, but they're not. It's normal to them. And that has to be the, the, the pace and the tone. Like, it has to be. So if I'm focused on dropping you into a really intense situation, it's like all that other stuff is lost. And then we have to go back and start over. And I'd rather just start you where it needs to start. And that starts with Steve and Silas sneaking into the VR arcade to play the game because that's the center of their culture. That's the, f the center of their focus. F for a large part of that people's lives, that's why they work. 
so that they can have more money to spend in the arcade. And you learn a little bit about that in the prologue as well. Speaking of the prologue, there is some imagery where you'll see people that look like they're starving and just broken and decayed and, you know, black eyes. Um, there's an image of a girl holding on to her chest like this while there's a ghostly figure embracing her to, to suggest that, you know, there are people that are revisiting lost loved ones, um, stuff like that. And then after explaining this to you visually, then we drop you into Steven Silas, sneaking into the arcade. So then the question becomes, like, we know why the arcade is cool. We want to do it ourselves. That's why we create these stories. But after that experience is done, then what happens? Then what, where, does, where do their lives go? So their, their lives are interrupted and they're in the real world. And the effects of the VR have left Silas changed. And he starts to have these powers. And now we're getting into spoilers. But I mean, it's, I, I have to talk to you guys about this stuff because a lot of this isn't in the prologue of the first book. And I haven't had a chance to tell that part of the story. So... He's got powers and he's trying to figure out how to use them and they're developing very quickly. And that part has to be emphasized in the writing. Um, they, his powers are developing so quickly that it's kind of freaking him out because it's intuitive to use. It's like flexing a muscle, he says in one part of the story. And it, it, he also describes it as he's remembering things even though they haven't, they haven't happened, even though... He has never been taught how to use his powers. The way that they're developing, it's coming to him like memories, like like he's remembering how to use his powers is the, is the way that he can... It's the only way he can explain it. And I need to emphasize that quite a bit because when you see him do things and then, you know, like the first time he uses his powers, he passes out. But then the second time he doesn't. And you're like, well, why? And that's why, because... They're developing quickly, and it's and it's integrating into his brain that is like a part of him, and so he 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 he's kind of reverse remembering things. Now, now that I've told you about that part of the main story, um, tell you about some of the other characters. Uh, we have Kaisen, who's the villain of the story, and Kaisen is a mysterious character, even to me as the writer who comes off as evil for the sake of being evil. And really, it's... it's it's I've designed him to be a hard personality. He built Kasonic Enterprises from the ground up. He invented the tech, a lot of the tech that the society runs on. But then all of that was taken away from him by the government because he's too hard to work with. And they gave him a little piece of, you know, what he invented, giving him that arcade... And letting him run the arcade, and that's really just the government giving him some sort of venting space as a, as a way of, um, like they're just tolerating him. Because he's so smart, they kind of need him around, but at the same time, he's so smart they can't trust him, and so they give him this arcade to keep him busy, so he's not so much of a distraction. But he's the one that has invented a lot of the tech that their society is built on now, and they built it in such a way where. They got to a certain point, and then they took it away from them, and they had other engineers come in and reverse engineer and, and redirect some things. And so he's very bitter about that, and he's very upset. And part of the untold story, and it's implied very heavily in the audio drama, and this is some stuff that I eventually want to talk about, in the real story is that it cost him his family and I, I don't want to reveal how it cost him his family but what we do know and what I am willing to tell you guys is that he's been trying to recreate his daughter through AI so we know that he lost his daughter we know that it's scarred him permanently it to, to the point of obsession, and he's been obsessively trying to recreate his daughter in the VR arcade, which is why he works on it so hard. Um, so it's his pet project, really, th that allows him to reconnect with his with his lost family. 
and then the side effect is that he's developed this technology that he can now make a living on that further fuels his research so that he can continue to perfect it for his own purposes. And um, we find out that the, that the AI that runs the VR is the image of his daughter. So all of this stuff comes around full circle and um, these are the jumping, the jump off points for the story. Not only do you have the story of a boy who's accidentally gotten powers and they're rapidly developing and he doesn't know what to do with them and and the, and the company wants it back, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out what he did wrong and how can they fix it and they blame him for it so they're trying to get him. But at the same time, you have this maniacal crazy scientist that invented everything using that same technology for his own purposes and then the the technology is messed up so you know there's some stuff there that I, I don't want to give away too much but the AI is developing its own desires and and so now you have more competing desires you know so Kaisen thinks that the AI is meant for him to do what he wants to do in terms of like seeing his daughter again but now the AI has its own agenda and it competes with his agenda and then on top of that the government that put him there as a distraction has their own agenda and now that he's just seemingly being way too weird now they have to go find out why he's being weird which adds more conflict to the situation so they don't know about the boy and he's trying to keep that under wraps but he needs to get the boy back so that he can find out what is wrong with his computer and now the computer has its own agenda and the government doesn't know about that either and so he's trying to keep all this stuff from the government while simultaneously using the power of the government to further his own agenda so everybody's trying to screw over everybody except for silas he's just trying to get be left alone and he's got the government after him or not the government i'm sorry he's got kasonic enterprises after him and so in the story what should be happening is kasonic enterprises trying to get silas he's running from them then the government's going after Kasonic Enterprises, but Kaisen is trying to keep all of his secrets while main, you know, while furthering his plan to get the boy back. And if the government ever finds out, as Steve says in the story, then they're really screwed because they have nowhere to run. So they're trying to figure out how to run to a place where they, where nobody knows about what's going on. And in all of this mess, um, we end up running into criminals, and then we end up running into conflict that they weren't ready for, and that is a lot of chaos that I can't, I can't explain it and be vague anymore. So I don't want to give away spoilers for the story. I just want to show you that there is a lot of directions that we're going in with this, and I'm excited for you to experience it. You can listen to the audio drama version of it for free on my website. If you go to zeroforhire.com, you'll see the last day podcast in my podcast section. So um, go to, go to zeroforhire.com, click on podcasts, and the last day podcast is there. It'll take you where you can listen to those five episodes. They're each about 25 minutes long. It's episodic. It's a lot of great voice acting and sound effects and um, very little narration. It's not an audio book. It's an actual like production. And I had a great time putting that together. A lot of people have enjoyed it. And the comic is going to be even more expansive. So if, if you really want to know what the story is about, aside from this last 20-something minutes that I've been talking, the best thing I can really tell you is to listen to the audio drama. If you're really curious about the story, listen to the audio drama. If you want to just go along for the ride, I really need your help. So we launched our Indiegogo campaign on, I think it was Saturday, Friday or Saturday. Either way, it was before the weekend. Today is Monday. We're about 25% of the way there. 
I can't finish putting this first book out without your help. I feel like once we get this first book produced, then I'll have something that I can take to other, you know, comic book shops or other cons or whatever, comic, comic cons, not convicts, uh, people that can help me put it in, in front of more comic book fans and we can grow this brand. But right now we got to get to that $500 mark or above so that I can get as much of the first book done as possible. We have two pages that I need to do. I, I took the original script for the first book and shrank it down to 22 pages. It's originally like a 36 to 38 page book, but I would need, I would need more than what I'm asking for to do that. Right now, I've shrunk down that first issue. I need to do one more page on each, the beginning and the end in order for it to make sense. And what I'm doing is dropping you into the middle of a situation and flowing it through and then pulling you out before it gets too crazy. And that will give you a good, solid adventure, um, a, a little taste of what their world is like. And um, it should leave you wanting more, you know. And then I will have three covers made. One by each of the artists working on the book because there are two artists. And then I have a friend that I asked to commission a work from her. So hopefully three different covers for you guys to choose from. That should be a lot of fun. And um, we'll see what else I can do with the rest. So I need your help to put, the, to put this book together and to make it as best quality as possible. Um, I hope that explaining a lot of the plot about the last day is enough to get you excited. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I have so many more storylines and, and plot points that, that we want to touch on and get to. But I can't give stuff away without ruining the book. And I don't want to ruin the book. I don't want to ruin the story. I just want you guys to be able to enjoy it. And I want to enjoy creating this process. So thanks for listening to what I'm saying here, thanks for watching this video, listening, whatever you're doing, and I uh, hope you guys will go support the project on Indiegogo. It's The Last Day, the comic. So if you just go to Indiegogo, um, I don't know how it's, it's like slash. If you go to Indiegogo and search for The Last Day, the comic, it should come up. Um, you can also go to thelastdaycomic.com, and I have links there. That way you can support and um, read up more, catch up. That's all I got. I'll talk to you guys soon with more videos in the, in the very near future.